Father, Son, and Violin A personal life story tells the vivid of Mao's China. Daniel Olson Chen Dedicated to my parents and all of their generation. Special Acknowledgements My special thanks to Ms. Mercedes Labenz, without her encouragement and inspiration, hard work in editing, artwork and her publishing assistance, this book would never have been made public. Chapter 14, My Third Stage of Learning the Violin 1. From an Amateur to a Professional At the end of chapter 13, I mentioned a phone call from the head office of the construction company. The man on the phone ordered me to show up at the company head office immediately. It was a long way from my workplace to the head office of the company. I pedaled my bike as hard as I could all the way down, imagining every bad thing possible and my self-defense excuses. When I arrived at the gate of the head office out of breath, the always arrogant doorman, abnormally polite, led me to a meeting room, where sat a group of company leaders around a meeting table. Seeing my face at the door, everyone stood up and welcomed me. That overwhelming atmosphere made me feel as though I was being mistakenly favored without rhyme or reason. To make a long story short, the company informed me that all my papers were transferred away from the company, and from then on, I was a member of the Hunan Beijing Opera. My former working foreman Pang was invited to give an opening speech. In the speech he stressed, It is our company's pride that we raised such a talent. He went on to give quite a few examples of how hard I studied my violin and how much he understood me and supported me. He said this all very naturally, shamelessly, and with great satisfaction. Thank God no one really paid attention to his hot air as all were busy eating fish-skinned peanuts and drinking tea. When someone proposed that the celebration deserved a few bottles and dishes, the company leader ordered me to report to the opera straight away. Is this some kind of joke? I simply couldn't believe my ears. Thinking back from school to then, I had countless auditions just to get into a performing group, any group that might take me. Each time, after the family political record checkup, they all ended with the same result, regrets. Later I found it was all because I had an uncle living in the United States. At that time anyone having an overseas relation was at a huge political disadvantage. After the same result again and again, I had gotten used to the failure and accepted the possibility of never becoming a member of any professional music group. Yet the acceptance by the Hunan Beijing Opera, the highest level in the province, came to me so suddenly especially, without an audition. Looking at the dirty oily work uniform and smelly army shoes with holes that wrapped my body and feet, it occurred to me that I couldn't remember how many days since I last had a shower. I should be all right if it was within a week, for with such an appearance how could I go see teacher you? Nevertheless, an order is an order, as the Chinese say, a military order is like a falling mountain, in no way to disobey. I ran to a washroom to clean up a little but it turned out to be in vain as there was no mirror and no water from the tap. I just wiped my face with toilet paper I had brought, there was no toilet supplying system in China at that time, shaped my hair a little with liquid from my mouth and then was on my bike again wildly headed to the Hunan Beijing Opera. Wretched and breathless, I reached the front gate of the opera. Even before I finished my self-introduction to the gateman, he pointed to a big rehearsal hall and said, just go. Everybody is there. That confirmed the unbelievable news, I was made a member of the opera. With extraordinarily high spirits, I flew to the rehearsal hall. When I rushed into the rehearsal hall with a huge smile, I was more terrified than astonished to see what was going on inside. There were eight portraits, hung on the wall. In front of the portraits all the members of the opera were sitting on the ground, crying, sobbing, weeping and sighing. The ones who made the most sound must be the family members of the dead, among them were Teacher Yu's pretty, 
elegant wife and their little boy. I looked up at the portraits again, the familiar face of my teacher you with a little cold smile appeared. Oh, my God, I met my chairman Mao. An administrator came to me and took me out of the sea of tears to another office building. Everybody calls me Secretary Deng. He introduced himself with a friendly smile. Then he turned to a very serious tone, briefly telling me how an unbelievable tragedy had happened to the opera. It happened during a trip in which the opera went to the countryside to give some performances. When they took a boat across the Dongting Lake, the largest lake in Hunan province, the boat turned over in the middle. We lost eight comrades, including your teacher comrade Yu. Deng narrated with tears running out. But, but my teacher is very good at swimming, he even has a nickname, Duck, how could a duck drown? My question remained unanswered, as it was unanswerable. Secretary Deng then told me it was Teacher Yu's wife who recommended me, for according to the policy, the families who lost their loved ones could have won from the family take over the position, as Teacher Yu's son was too small, I became the lucky one. A teacher's life for a student's new life, even if it was God's will, isn't that will being a little too cruel. It shouldn't be hard to imagine how complicated my feelings were, the sadness of my teacher's death, the sorrow for his family, the gratitude for the recommendation from his wife, and last but not least, the excitement in the change of my destiny. The same day, after the gathering, I went to see his wife with great grief on my face. But his wife appeared rather calm. I expressed my compassion and gratitude, offering my help, any help that was within my ability since my teacher was gone. Since your teacher is gone. She followed my words. It's meaningless for us to go on living here. Therefore, we will soon move back to Beijing. The wife thanked me the same, then handed a few violin music scores that were prepared on the piano, to me, including Road which the teacher once lent to me. That was the last time I saw the pretty wife of my teacher. On the second morning, after hesitation, I went to my workplace as usual, for beside the fact that I should say goodbye to my workmates, I needed to finish the cement fence for the panda house at the zoo. It was urgent. To my surprise, when I arrived, all my fellow workers were gathered waiting to give me a farewell party and the organizer was the long-time no-see Uncle Fong. Everyone talked in turn about my kindness and the good things I had done for the company as well as to them. With most, I either didn't know or had forgotten, such as my taking over heavy jobs for the women and the old, I read newspapers for everyone during the political study hours. One old man narrated with tears, how I had walked an extra distance accompanying him to a bus stop on a rainy day with my umbrella. His moving tone made quite a few others run at their noses too. Ah, people, I mean Chinese people, why do you have to wait until someone is leaving, or dead for all the good parts to be seen and mentioned? After the party I accomplished those cement flower-shaped balusters, thought of as my last works, I outreached my attention and skills. About thirty years later, I went to the zoo and saw my works still standing firmly between pandas and their viewers. The year 1974 marked a milestone in my life. After four years working at the construction company, I stepped into a new world, the world of being a professional violinist of which I had dreamed for years. Two, when come true dreams became dull. Moved into the dormitory of the opera, the twenty-year-old me, being called the Nine Brother, for the first time in my life had a key to a room, and in the room a bed that belonged to me, to me only. More exciting, a professional violin, not the 400 renminbi level that Dugua had at the city opera, but a 800 renminbi, the eighth grade, the highest grade violin made in the Shanghai Violin Factory. Yet with the 8th grade, I soon lost satisfaction as I remembered that my teacher you used to play on an old Italian violin, which was being repaired in Shanghai after having gotten wet. But there was something else, other than my teacher's Italian violin that I wanted even more badly, my teacher's position, the seat of concertmaster of the orchestra. 
Not very long after I got into the opera, my girlfriend Jingwa's mother forced her to break up with me, as I had turned myself from a worker, working class was the most respectable class at that time, into an entertainer. With the heavy pressure of an only daughter, and with her eyes closed, Jinghua was married to some worker as arranged by her mother. It was quite a period of time. I had no girlfriend as I had to concentrate all my energy and time on my violin studies. However, Mimi, known as my sister, came to see me regularly. Somehow, as we both were growing more and more mature, we really behaved more and more like brother and sister. Both feeling more and more shameful about what we did when we were younger, never mentioning those things again. Through the channel of Mimi, I learned that my mother remained the same, living life like a clock, doing exactly the same circling every day. On the other hand, my father had been brought back from the May 7th Cadre School, countryside, to his original work unit, city. As for my elder brother Danson, after having done three years hard labor building railways as one of thousands of volunteers, he also came back home. Thanks to his special interest in photography, which had contributed a great deal to the regional newspaper during the three-year period, he was assigned to the photographic department of the Hunan Medical University, part of the old and present Yale University. From then till today, he is working in the same building where he was jailed for about a month. What a joke of, not knowing whether to laugh or cry, fate is playing on him. But information regarding my youngest brother Dan Han was inadequate. I did meet Dan Han once. It was at a political gathering of all performing units of the Hunan province. The acrobatic unit was beside our Beijing opera. I kept searching, head by head, finally finding my little brother who was no longer little but rather a muscled man. The very moment I caught him with my eye, I discovered he was actually looking at me. When our four eyes met, he revealed a little excitement and uneasiness. I took the role of breaking the ice by waving at him, while he seemed regretful, he immediately turned his face away from me, never turning back. Because of my struggle for the seat of concertmaster, in addition to the piles of shortcomings and problems, such as my maternal genetic problem of, never getting along with people, made me among the most unpleasant people at the opera. Meetings of, criticizing and helping, were frequently serviced for me. All the merit about me seemed to be only one, great and extreme endeavor to practice the violin. That was entirely true, I devoted almost all of myself to the violin. I was really, keeping my nose to the grindstone, going mad practicing my violin. Every morning my violin sounded out, mixing with the young singers, ee, -E -E, aaa, before the crack of dawn. For my further study, the opera arranged a violin teacher from the provincial music school, a small lady named Guishumin, who was one of the very few fully qualified professional violin teachers in the province. If I am allowed to tell the truth, the period of studies with teacher Guo was as dull and bitter for me as for her. As to me, to play the violin was no longer for fun, the purpose was not only to satisfy my feelings, but a serious and rational job. The violin was just a tool. The importance was not my affection but intonation, rhythm, and technique. That kind of playing suppressed my musical enthusiasm and changed the flavor of my musical style. As for teacher Guo, her headache was to reshape an amateur fancier into a professional performer. That was like training a wild horse to be a gentle pet. Teacher Gua, why do you only give me all these dull and tasteless etudes? It makes my feelings get stuck in the middle of my throat with no way out. I inquired dissatisfied. Ha ha ha. Teacher Gua laughed, in a way worse than crying. She explained. That's exactly where your problem is, too much feeling and too little reason. To teach you how to play the violin is like a doctor curing a patient. Only strong and bitter medicine can help you get rid of your bad amateur habits. As a violinist, even playing the violin became a dull business, what else could be worse? Would you imagine, not only my violin was a tool, but also I, the performer had to become a tool, a tool of uniting the people and fighting the enemy, as our great leader Chairman Mao taught us. Everyday work was to play those incomprehensible, revolutionary model Beijing opera, and off work I was to practice all those boring etudes. Allow me to make a rather vulgar yet vivid parable. 
No matter how crazy one likes sex, when lovemaking becomes one's occupation, a job, and one couldn't make a living without making love for eight hours each day, how long could one keep going on liking sex? Therefore, after a period of time with such a life, hand copying scores, rehearsals, performances, as soon as working hours were over, I threw the violin away, never wanting to touch it. I remember once, one of my brother Danson's best friends got married. During the wedding someone suggested that I give a little entertainment by playing the violin. If that had been before, it would have been my favorite opportunity to show off, but on that particular day I responded coldly, my working hours are over. Writing this reminds me of an article saying, anything you enjoy doing, stay an amateur. Two years with the opera had passed, I felt unexplainably low and lost. Not only had I still not gotten the position as concertmaster that I so much wanted in the beginning, but more importantly, I had lost the goal or maybe even the meaning of life. I wrote in my diary, when a withered person in a desert discovered an oasis and used his last bit of strength to reach it, then found himself stuck in a marsh concealed by the oasis, in how much despair could he be? This perhaps, is a vivid description of my frame of mind at that time. Hence, I was in real need to change my life and readjust myself mentally for a while. It was at that moment an opportunity fell in my lap. In 1977 I did something my father had been doing for decades, watching the peasants in the countryside as one of the Communist Party representatives although I was no party member, in fact, a planet far away from it. It was in this year that I experienced the rock-bottom life of Chinese society. I lived together with the peasants, and like the peasants, once literally starved to death, well almost to death. This later influenced my change of view on society tremendously and affected my attitude toward the poor throughout my entire life. My other novel titled, Under a Banana Tree, has a detailed description of my experiences and observations from that year. 1978, with handmade cotton shoes and a bamboo pack bag, I returned to my workplace, the Hunan Beijing Opera. With suntan skin and rough hands, I was given the old Italian violin which had belonged to my teacher Yu, along with his position, as concertmaster of the orchestra. The position I had fought for two years but couldn't get came to me like a cup of tea. It made me feel that the position was some kind of reward for my hard and outstanding work in the countryside, which gave me little pleasure or satisfaction of achievement. Being seated on the first chair, I soon realized that I was inadequate for the position. First of all, I knew very little about Beijing opera. Secondly, I was far lacking in orchestral experience. As a matter of fact, my personality and violin playing style were not at all suitable for an orchestra, which was proved later in several Western countries. Are you meeting Ma Xiaomao? One day, I was out having something to eat and happened to catch sight of a very familiar face by the bus stop. Very familiar might not be completely accurate, as the face was much darker than what I remembered. However, I wasn't wrong for that face greeted me. Ma Xiaomao, I mean Ma Manfei, I thought you went to Xinjiang. Why are you here? I was truly surprised. Ma gave a pale smile as an answer. During the interlude waiting for the bus, she told me that the life at Xinjiang Construction Corps was much too hard for her and absolutely not a place she could survive. But Flute Chin insisted, the more bitter the place the more revolutionary I will become, and it was unthinkable to be a deserter. In that case, Ma had to escape. She got back all by herself and was working at a candy factory. Poor Flute Chin. He gave up going in the army with all the others and chose Xinjiang because of you. But now you left him alone. Don't you worry. He said as soon as I leave him he would find a Xinjiang girl and become rooted there. Ma uttered with a sour tone and lots of resentment. To break the awkwardness she changed the subject to someone else, telling me that Wang Shi's father was liberated and returned to his old job as a professor at the Hunan Medical University and Wang Shi himself, 
was given a very good job after his high school graduation. How is Lu Xiaobing? I urgently asked. She went on to study at university, and after that. No, 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 I mean how are Lu and Wang? I asked again very impatiently. You really don't know anything, do you? Ma laughed. After stretching her suspense long enough, she told me that the two were about to get married. Really? Congratulations. The bus was approaching. If there's something I can do to help, please come to me. I shouted at her back, with a feeling of superiority. What can you possibly do for me? You know I gave up the violin a long time ago. She said without turning her head, only raising her hand to wave, meaning goodbye, if not meaning, get out. Ma Xiaomao used to be a fragile and delicate flower in my memory, but now was much withered. Four, my dream of becoming number one violinist of Hunan province came true. Along with the down of the gang of four, Mao's hard lines with Mao's wife Jiang Qin in it, were crushed soon after Mao's death, the entire eight models of Beijing operas vanished, together with their maker. The Beijing opera went back to the style of its old days. The Western orchestra was no longer in need. Meaning we were all going to be out of a job. It was at that crucial moment, the composer of the province, Lu Xingqiu, created a symphonic Beijing opera in praise of Premier Zhou, for which a full Western orchestra was needed. For that, we had to combine the orchestra of the provincial sing and dance unit as well as the city opera, where I used to go visiting Dugua during my school years, and conductor Xiao was appointed to be the conductor for the show. As the show was Beijing opera, our orchestra functioned as the backbone and I, the concertmaster of our small orchestra, was naturally put in a position as concertmaster of the whole orchestra. Seeing all the violinists sitting behind me, especially Dugua sitting far, far behind me, the vivid expression, walking two feet off the ground, was not enough to describe my satisfaction and exultation. When conductor Xiao appeared in front of the orchestra, I was reminded of the letter I wrote to him in my school years. I swear to you that someday I will become the number one violinist, and you will have to lead your orchestra crawling and rolling to follow my rhythm. Which I felt like shouting out once more in his face. Xiao was the conductor of the city opera, a rank lower than the provincial orchestra, which became the reason for being looked down upon and teased by a few young musicians who would intentionally play wrong notes or delay half a beat to see whether Xiao was able to determine the mistakes. This made the pearls on top of Zhao's head bigger and brighter than ever under the spotlight. Seeing all of this, I was amused and happy with a sense that my resentment was being avenged, totally forgetting the seat upon which I was sitting in the orchestra. That is, until my feet were next to crippled after being trampled by my co-player next to me, Yi Rongbi, who always acted like a big sister to me, and actually did most of the job that I, the concertmaster supposed to do. I corrected my attitude, supporting the conductor and criticizing the naughty ones. During intermission I went to conductor Xiao to show my sympathy and warmth, but received a cold response in return. Later someone told me that Xiao was not at all happy with me on the seat, not because of my delay in stopping the naughty ones and supporting him in full, but rather due to my inadequacy to hold the position. Even the concertmaster is a cripple in rhythm, how could my left hand be healthy? I was outraged by hearing the rumor, thinking that such a return of viciousness for favor person must be punished. I had no chance to do so as he himself quit before that. Ironically, this time it was he who left a notice to me saying, I'll pursue my study from now on and I promise you someday I will be the number one conductor of the Hunan province. That show was huge, in fact the biggest in the Hunan stage's history. It took place at the Hunan Theater. The media, TV, newspapers, radio were all present. I sent three tickets home hoping my father would come to see my glory on the stage. But only mother, Danson, and Mimei showed up and passed me the message that father was not interested in Beijing opera. In reality, 
He bought the cheapest black and white TV set he could find and took it home on his bicycle when I was on the stage playing. When mother and Danson went back home after the show, father was still sweating, adjusting the antenna and the channel of the TV set. The show is already over. My mom said to my father. I'm not tuning in for the show. I want to see some news from CCTV. Central China TV. My father said impatiently. According to my observations, father does not easily become impatient under normal circumstances. Five, teacher Gao escalates me to higher education. As I mentioned before, I had a new violin teacher Gao, who was supposed to be the best teacher in Hunan province at the time. But I also explained how and why I didn't really enjoy my lessons with her, at least not as much as when I was with teacher Li. Besides all of that, to take lessons from teacher Gao I had to travel on my bike about an hour each way, this is one of the excuses I used to stop taking lessons from her, besides being deadly busy with the opera show. One day after the rehearsal, teacher Gao showed up. She asked me a question before I could even attempt to form some excuses for not taking lessons anymore. What would you like to do in the future? What future? I didn't understand what she was talking about. Your future. You are a young man in your twenties, the prime of your life. I think you should pursue studies for a higher goal, she said. Oh, that. But I'm already gold. You see, teacher, I'm sitting on the first seat of the whole province. This is my utmost goal. I have no more goal. I answered honestly. Listen, how great is it to sit on the first chair of the province, the Hunan province, and how big is the Hunan province, compared with Shanghai, compared with the world? What do you mean, teacher? I mean, what do you want me to do? I puzzled. People going up, water going down. Have you heard that? I know a teacher from Shanghai Conservatory who would come to Changsha for new students. I think you should try. You should prepare yourself for the opportunity. Seeing me silent, wondering, Teacher Gao added. Come to me after the opera show season is over. I'll help you prepare for the entrance exam to study in Shanghai. But, Shanghai. A vast city, far away. Is this a place for me, the little nine brother, a Hunan bumpkin? Teacher Gao left no room for negotiation. It felt a little strange, as I had never been a very good student of hers. Why did she suddenly became so serious about me, and, put so much pressure on me? 1978 was the first time the Chinese Art and Music Academies openly recruited new students after the Cultural Revolution. The Shanghai Music Conservatory sent a famous professor, Sheng Zhonghua, the sister of Sheng Zhonghua who was supposed to be the number one violinist in China, at least at that time, to Hunan to recruit new students. Teacher Gao personally knew teacher Sheng, so she went to meet her at the station with most of her students, including me, the little nine brother. As soon as the train stopped, we saw Professor Sheng waving her hand, walking down from the carriage. The elegant appearance of the VIP left a deep impression. Off the train, the professor was surrounded by us. Teacher Gao introduced us one by one, and the professor shook hands with us one after another. Although the professor acted politely, she looked a little lost. When it came to my turn she suddenly uttered. Did I forget something on the train? Violin. Teacher Gao responded. You can't come without your violin, can you? Right, 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 my violin. The professor rushed back to the carriage and returned with her violin. When I stretched my hand out, waiting for my turn to shake hands, she thought I was offering my help to carry her violin. How nice and thoughtful of you. She praised me with her violin in my hand. On the way to the hotel the professor still looked somewhat absent-minded and all the questions asked her went in one ear and out the other. Gao stopped us and asked her again. 
Calm down and think once more, is there something else left on the train? Violin, suitcase, handbag, shoes, hat and no more. Sheng nodded her head rather firmly, but she added. It should be everything and no more. With a tone obviously persuading no one but herself. After we said goodbye at the front of the hotel and walked out, we were all simultaneously sharing our impressions of the professor. Just as I made my bold remark, the professor acted like a fly without a head, the professor rushed out shouting. I forgot, forgot. She was out of breath. Calm down and take a deep breath, now tell us, forgot what? Teacher Gao asked, with her hand petting the professor's shoulder. I forgot. Oh my god, I left my daughter on the train. She was sleeping, that's how I forgot. What an artist and a mother. Ha ha ha. The audition took place the next morning. One after another we played our violins on the stage while Professor Sheng, with her reading glasses on her nose, sat quietly, keeping her eyes down, focused on her lap. I wondered why, and had a peep. Oh my god, no, oh my chairman Mao. She was reading a music score, the violin concerto, Butterfly Lovers, the only known Chinese violin concerto in all of Chinese violin music history. Later I found out the whole thing was a formality, as that year and every year from then on, the Shanghai Conservatory of Music took only a few violin students and the positions were filled before any auditions had even taken place. A place like Hunan, a place even birds wouldn't shit, as people remarked, had no chance whatsoever at the very beginning. That's why the professor wanted to make the most out of the trip by giving a recital in Hunan, the place her own mother was originally from. And so, a chance landed in my lap. It happened when Sheng had her rehearsal with the orchestra. Her violin opened at the side, which occurs often when an instrument is brought from one place to another with different humidity levels. The noise from the opening of the violin irritated her so badly that she had to stop in the middle of the rehearsal. I told the professor that it was a huge problem to her but a cup of tea to me as I had once made a violin from scratch. After the concert, besides teacher Gao, I was the only student asked to see the professor off to the station. Waiting for the train to come, the professor complained that there were too few violin makers and repairers in the country. Then her eyes lit up, she said. Oh yes, now I remember that the director of the conservatory, Professor Tang, is making a new course for violin making. He asked me to keep an eye out for talented students if I should meet. I could recommend you if you're interested. Seeing me not so interested she added. Of course the violin making students also learn to play the violin. As far as you are in Shanghai, with a small charge, you could also take private lessons, say, from me. Teacher Gao made no obvious response, but from her face I knew that she at least did not oppose the idea. She waited for my response. Yet I gave no response. How could I respond? I made a white ugly violin at the age of 13 purely due to the lack of money. The purpose of making that violin was to play violin. But now I had an old Italian violin in my hand and the seat of the concertmaster, why on earth would I go back to learning how to make violins? There was a gap of silence until the train was coming. I carried her luggage and teacher Gao took her violin. The professor herself, held her daughter so tightly that the eight-year-old girl was screaming in pain. Unexpectedly, later on teacher Gao suggested that it may be a good idea and opportunity, my going to Shanghai as a violin-making student. She said, For sure this is a shortcut for you to go to Shanghai. As far as you are there, you can learn anything you like and as much as you like. You can still be a great violinist after that. I didn't give the teacher a concrete answer, as I didn't have one. Only puzzled, why did teacher Gao so much want me to go to Shanghai? Why? Six, the end of the Hunan Beijing Opera Orchestra and the beginning of the Hunan Radio and TV Orchestra. In 1978, 
The huge symphonic Beijing opera in praising Premier Zhou marked the momentary recovery of consciousness just before the death of our orchestra. Soon after the concert, not only us, but the Western orchestras of all Beijing operas nationwide were disbanded. Where to go was the question placed in front of every orchestra member. Hence, as the old Chinese saying, the eight immortals cross the sea, each applies one's own special skills, we each had to find a way out for ourselves. Some went to the orchestra belonging to the singing and dance troupe, and a few went to the Hunan Film Manufacture Studio, and some gave up a career in music and started something totally new. In regard to me, besides escaping the challenge, I wanted to escape from the city in which I had lived most of my 24-year life as I started to get tired of it. I chose Gillen, a little place of natural beauty known as the Xanadu. The local singing and dance orchestra accepted my application on the spot and with the offer of concertmaster. Yet, at the same time, all my personal papers had already been transferred to another unit without anyone consulting with the man to whom the papers belonged. It so happened that at the same time the new Hunan radio and TV orchestra was established and the majority of the musicians from our Beijing opera were transferred to it, including me. It was Li, the head of the Hunan radio and TV, CEO, in the West, who received me when I went to inquire why. He used his official jargon in a rather soft tone, saying, The rapid development of the radio and TV require us to establish an orchestra. He followed by making it known that the solid financial resource would provide the best quality musical instruments and training for the musicians, possibly all being sent to Beijing for a year. He paused a little, drank some tea and announced, For setting up the best orchestra in the province, we need a talented violinist, such as you, to be the concertmaster. He stressed the two words, talented and concertmaster, or perhaps the two words sounded specially stressed to me. Anyway, I went in discontented and came out with satisfaction and joy. That resulted in my trip, the first and last time to Gillen, being an album of black and white sightseeing photographs. New orchestra, new environment, new colleagues, everything was fresh and exciting. I felt happy and enjoyed myself every day, totally forgetting Teacher Gao's expectation of me to get out of Changsha and pursue my studies in Shanghai. A couple of months later, the orchestra was to give its debut concert on the radio and TV. Of course. We were all too excited to sleep. It was at midnight that something odd happened. It was Mimi along with a cute little round-figured girl who came to see me. They told me with anxiety. Something's wrong, your brother Dansin is missing. Then I remembered who that round girl was. She was the so-called, big sister with my father's clock on her wrist, the one I met at my father's place when I visited him some years ago at the countryside. All that they told me was not important, the only thing important to me is to find my brother Danson, before it is too late. <laughs>